Good morning. How's everyone doing? This is great. We have a little strobe light up here, so we're going to turn this into a dance uh, party pretty soon. <laughs> yeah, one little light strobing up there. It's going to drive me nuts. <laughs> uh, so before we start, we just have some quick announcements this morning. If you guys got an email from Tom, uh, the elders are calling a prayer meeting on Tuesday and Wednesday, uh, Tuesday at 7 p.m. Now it's 24 hours straight of prayer. We're encouraging people to sign up for a time slot to pray. If you are having a hard time signing up with the form that was sent out, you can call the church office and Linda can put you into a time slot. But basically it's like, hey, this is Peter Belshiner is going to pray at 1230 at night and from 1230 to 1. Uh, so it's just really a call to action for us, the church body, to pray for uh, the call process. Specifically, this is what this 24 hours is for, is for the call process. Uh, one of the things we're going to do on Tuesday night at 7 p.m. to start off this 24 hours, uh, we'll be in the fellowship room and we're going to have a live stream with prayer and worship uh, that will be led by myself and the elders to just kick this off and hopefully kick you guys in the butt and get you excited to pray for the call process because uh, it's so important. And we just want to make sure that everyone understands the importance of that 24 hours and the significance of it. The, the Wednesday uh, is 6.30 p.m.? Yeah, and that's another hour of prayer. So we encourage you, if you don't feel comfortable coming out, uh, we'll have Tuesday live stream, but Wednesday we will not. Uh, that's all I have for announcements. Tom does too. So we're going to hand it over to him, and then we're going to read Scripture. Thank you, Peter. <clears throat> Listen carefully to uh, this morning's epistle lesson, Paul's first letter to Corinthians chapter 9. The end of that uh, reading, uh, Paul compares himself with an athlete, a runner specifically, uh, being disciplined. If any of you have been participants in sports, you know there's a discipline involved in that. You're doing some things that maybe aren't necessarily comfortable, but they're for your good, for your strength, for your endurance. And also, if you're a runner, and today's Super Bowl Sunday, you know, goals are set. And it deals with that as well. Next Sunday, we're kicking off the 40-day challenge, the uh, Red Letter Challenge, which uh, basically is focusing on the words of Jesus. 
And Jesus' words are words of comfort and encouragement, but they're also words of challenge. They're words of, of getting going. And so uh, I'd encourage you, encourage you very strongly to participate in that for your spiritual health, for your spiritual discipline, for your spiritual endurance. We have, um, still have some of these books available. These are the books that you would follow for 40 days, a daily devotional. Actually, it begins on uh, Tuesday, the 16th of February, the, the day one, and then it goes through 40 days, taking you up, right up to, to Easter. And if you've got kids, primarily elementary age kids, these are pretty good for them as well. They could go through the same thing. They're available in the uh, Breezeway area. And probably to maximize your involvement in this, we do have several small groups, uh, some available by Zoom, some will be meeting here at church. If you'd like to be part of a small group or facilitate a small group, again, sign up in the, in the Breezeway area. We're going to see a, a video now that tells us more about the Red Letter Challenge, including the, the goals that are set and the need for discipline. So, Mike, if you please show those two videos. So I remember when I was nine years old, I loved basketball and I loved watching the dream team at the Olympics. It was Michael Jordan and Magic Johnson and Larry Bird and they were an amazing team. And so going into the Olympics that year, it wasn't who's gonna win the gold. Everybody knew the Americans were gonna win. It was who's gonna win silver or bronze. They won by 44 points a game average and so they won the gold medal. In the 2004 Athens Olympics, I remember another story about an American shooter named Matthew Emmons. And he was like the dream team, far and away better than the rest of the field. And it got to the point where he was so dominant that we got to the last shots and all he needed to do to secure the gold medal was simply hit the target anywhere on the page to win. So it turns out that when Matthew Emmons was approaching his last shots at the Olympics, he was focusing on his breathing. Because as a shooter, that's what makes the difference, is you want to slow that heart rate down as much as possible so that in between those beats per minute, you are shooting at just the right time. And so he was so focused on that, and sure enough, bullseye, 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 hit the target three times, right where he needed to. Except there was one problem. Matthew Emmons cross-fired. He was supposed to hit the target over here, and he hit the target over here. He was focused on the wrong target, and he lost it all. And I feel like as followers of Jesus, many times we're so focused and we have good intentions, but, but we're missing the mark when it comes to what Jesus is asking us to do. And the Red Letter Challenge is going to help you identify what it is that we are called to do as His followers. What's amazing about the Matt Emmons story is you can literally have the greatest marksman in the world but if you don't know what to focus on, none of it matters. D.L. Moody once said that our greatest fear shouldn't be a failure, but of succeeding at something that doesn't matter. And I think that's the problem with followers of Jesus. We don't really know what we're shooting at. We don't know what to aim for. And so we can look at what people say about us and we can look at and say, we're not judgmental, we're not hypocritical, we're not divisive. Or what we can say is, you know what, maybe we haven't done things right all the time. And maybe we can do better at this. And after all that Jesus has done for me, I want to be the greatest follower I can. I want to be the greatest representation of who he is. And so I need to change. We all need to change. And that's what the Red Letter Challenge is all about. It's about helping you identify what we can do as followers of Jesus to help change the story we're telling of who Jesus is. The part of the problem is people grab something from over here and try it, and then grab something from over here and try it. But I started thinking, Jesus has all the answers and so let's just go back to what Jesus said and as I did that I noticed five main principles let's call them five main targets of what we as his followers can shoot for and so in the first week of the Red Letter Challenge we're going to introduce you to those five main targets and then every week following we're going to give you one of those targets and so the first one we're going to give you is this target of being with Christ how important it is to actually spend time with him in his word and to pray earnestly and to fast and to take a Sabbath and really rest in who He is and what He's done for us. After we've been with Jesus, we're going to learn about His forgiveness. How can we not when we spend time with Jesus? And so we're going to learn how to be forgiven of everything that we've done and how then we can give that forgiveness to others. 
after we've been forgiven, man, it makes total sense that we need to go. We need to serve. We need to meet needs in our community. And so we're going to talk about what it means to truly be servants of Jesus. And after we serve, it's amazing how many times Jesus talked about giving. I believe it's impossible to be a stingy Christian. So we're going to take a look at what it means to be a truly generous person. And then we're going to close it up by talking about what it means to go with the message of Jesus, that we are his eyewitnesses and we get to tell people the good news that Jesus loved them, that Jesus died for them, and that Jesus has grace for them. And so I hope that you will join us on the next 40 days for the Red Letter Challenge. I believe that no matter who you are, if you've been a longtime Christian and you're feeling stale in your faith, if you are a brand new Christian, or if you're just wrestling with who Jesus is, I believe that by putting his word words into practice, you will find the life that you were made for. So that's the little red letter challenge. Get hooked up into a small group, uh, get involved. I'm actually hosting a small group. I'm usually not one to host things. I'm actually really excited about this because I think this is great. And I was talking to Tom before this. I'm like, how did you find this? This is awesome. I'm so excited. So uh, we're going to go through it. Uh, I'm going to go through it with the youth ministry. Um, you know, those, those kids uh, will enjoy it. Um, before we start, I just want to let you know there is a mic. There was a mic. I'll get it over there when Greg's reading the scripture. But um, this is a prayer, praise, and testimony Sunday. It's not your traditional Sunday service. This uh, is a good service because you guys get involved. So if you want to come up and lead a prayer, it doesn't have to be a testimony, right? If you have something you want to share that's a testimony, come up and share it. Uh, it's, you know, that's what this service is. It's for us to share with the body and the... Um, these are really fun. So we're going to try and get done by noon. Uh, it is snowing like crazy, so we're going to respect everyone's time and, and do that. So, Greg, if you would start us off with the scripture readings. Yep. Ah, this is the microphone on. This is a reading from the prophet Isaiah, chapter 40, verses 21 through 31. Do you not know? Do you not hear? Has it not been told you from the beginning? Have you not understood from the foundations of the earth? It is he who sits above the circle of the earth, and its inhabitants are like grasshoppers, who stretches out the heavens like a curtain and spreads them like a tent to dwell in, who brings princes to nothing and makes the rulers of the earth as emptiness. Scarcely are they planted, scarcely sown. Scarcely has the stem taken root in the earth when he blows on them and they wither and the tempest carries them off like stubble. To whom then will you compare me that I should be like him, says the Holy One. Lift up your eyes on high and see. Who created these? He who brings out their host by number, calling them all by name. By the greatness of his might, and because he is strong in power, not one is missing. Why do you say, O Jacob, and speak, O Israel, My way is hidden from the Lord, and my right is disregarded by my God? Have you not known? Have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He does not faint or grow weary. His understanding is unsearchable. He gives power to the faint, and to him who has no might, he increases strength. Even youths shall faint and be weary, and young men shall fall, exhausted. But they who wait for the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. So far, our Old Testament reading. Our epistle reading is from the first letter to the Corinthians, chapter 9, verses 16 through 27. For if I preach the gospel, that gives me no ground for boasting, for necessity is laid upon me. Woe to me if I do not preach the gospel, for if I do this of my own will, I have a reward. But if not of my own will, I am still entrusted with a stewardship. What then is my reward? 
that in my preaching I may present the gospel free of charge, so as not to make full use of my right in the gospel. For though I am free from all, I have made myself a servant to all, that I might win more of them. To the Jews I became as a Jew, in order to win Jews. To those under the law I became as one under the law, though not being myself under the law, that I might win those under the law. To those outside the law I became as one outside the law, not being outside the law of God, but under the law of Christ that I might win those outside the law. To the weak I became weak, that I might win the weak. I have become all things to all people, that by all means I might save some. I do it all for the sake of the gospel, that I may share with them in its blessings. Do you not know that in a race all the runners run, but only one receives the prize? So run that you may obtain it. Every athlete exercises self-control in all things. They do it to receive a perishable wreath, but we an imperishable. So I do not run aimlessly. I do not box as one beating the air, but I discipline my body and I keep it under control, lest after preaching to others, I myself should be disqualified. Please rise for the gospel if you are able. This, this reading is from the Gospel of Mark, chapter 1, starting with verse 29. And immediately Jesus left the synagogue and entered the house of Simon and Andrew with James and John. Now Simon's mother-in-law lay ill with a fever, and immediately they told him about her. And he came and took her by the hand and lifted her up, and the fever left her, and she began to serve them. That evening at sundown they brought to him all who were sick or oppressed by demons, and the whole city was gathered together at the door. And he healed many who were sick with various diseases and cast out many demons, and he would not permit the demons to speak because they knew him. And rising very early in the morning, while it was still dark, he departed and went out to a desolate place, and there he prayed. And Simon and those who were with him searched for him, and they found him and said to him, Everyone is looking for you. And he said to them, Let us go on to the next towns, that I may preach there also, for that is why I came out. And he went throughout Galilee, preaching in their synagogues and casting out demons. So far, the reading from the Gospel. He's coming on the clouds, kings and kingdoms will bow down. And every chain will break. His broken hearts declare His praise. For who can stop the Lord Almighty? Our God is the Lion, the Lion of Judah. He's roaring with power and fighting our battles. And every knee will bow before Him. Our God is the world, his blood breaks the chains, and every knee will bow before the lion and the lamb, every knee will bow before him. So
stop the Lord Almighty? Who can stop the Lord? Who can stop the Lord Almighty? Who can stop the Lord? That song came true in my life this week. 
I saw something on social media, on Facebook, and I shared it. And there was some fallout, a lot. The post said, no pastor can support same-sex marriage, homosexuality, transgender, abortion, and preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. I believe these things with all of my heart. I believe this church believes that. And to say there was fallout was an understatement. There were people who were genuinely asking why I believed this, questioning, and I patiently explained. And then there was one person, a pal from high school, all those years ago, who I'd reconnected with about 10 years ago on Facebook. And she was furious. And she informed me I was judging her and her two gay sons, and that I was a horrible, judgmental person, and all kinds of crap. And that if I answered her, she would unfriend and block me. And I didn't, I just prayed. And somebody else, a daughter from the congregation, answered her gently, carefully, and said, no, this isn't what she, this isn't what she meant. This is what she defended me. And answered her pain and this now former friend answered her back at a private message that was to say the least vile and that night I was praying about the whole situation as I was trying to fall asleep and I said Lord what's going on I was doing the right thing posting it. I know I was. I heard you telling me do it. What's going on? He said, the time is coming and is now upon you when you will begin to be reviled and persecuted for speaking the truth of my word. Don't take it personally. They aren't angry at you. They rage from the guilt they cannot face from their own sinfulness. Remain strong in your faith and in my love. Seek my face with your whole heart. Fall into my love and let me shelter your heart. Purify your hands in life. Seek holiness for your life. Walk in humility for me. I offer that for all of us. because every time we deal with homosexuality and, and everything like that, there's a, a judgmental view that every, the outside thinks that's going on. And um, I, I totally agree with what she's saying. The church has to speak up out of love. And we have no right in that script in the Bible. God says, if you change one word in here, one word, take out or put in, woe to you. And we should have that fear. we got to have a fear of God more than man. And it's hard because I have a, uh, someone in my family that's married in a, in a relationship, and I have a niece. But I do everything out of love. I remember Billy Graham, um, him and his daughter were driving home. And at that time, they were with the president, Clinton. And you remember the situation that was going on with the Monolinsky and all that. And, and his daughter said to him, she's like, Daddy, She's like, you are so gracious and so loving to, to, the, 
to them and, and you know what they're doing and you know what's going on. And he said, honey, let me share something with you. And he said, it's my job to love. It's the Holy Spirit job to convict. And it's God's job to judge. So everything we always have to do has to be out of love. We never have the right to judge. We never have the right to, to um, try to bring conviction on a person. When my um, family member comes up, I love them. I love them. They know where I stand. We've had a conversation one day because my wife was like, I don't want you to talk about it anymore. I was like, honey, I won't talk about it, but if it's brought up, i got to make a stand for where, where I am. And one day my niece said to me, she, she said, Uncle, you know, she said, she was struggling with it. I don't remember the exact conversation. I just said, Jenna, I always know this. I always love you. Always love you. I'm always here for you. I can't change this for you. And there's sin that's been in my life that God, I sat back in the back of that church for two years not taking communion because God was dealing with the sin in my life. He cried for me. But God is patient, he's gentle, he's loving. Yes, we're to fear him, we're to fear him. I just keep loving people, I, I agree. We have to speak up, the church has to speak up. We're, this country is in the problem it is because the pulpit is trying to compromise God's scripture. It's the truth that sets us free. It's the truth that sets us free, it's not. It's the truth. We need the truth. Truth without mercy is cruel. Truth is grace and mercy, but you have to have truth in order to love people. So, so one other thing I really want to say is I keep on getting a vision, and I want to honor somebody here today. God keeps giving me a vision, like, and he shows you looking up like this. And he wants to let you know he loves you, and you're very quiet, and you're very humble, and you do so much. He wants to let you know you, you he sees everything you do. Everything you do, and he loves you, and like we love you, and we appreciate the part of the body here you are. I just want to share it with you. I'm going to give you a card and write it out. I apologize because I, I probably should have done this a while back because this vision's been with me for a while. So that way, when you're having a bad day, you can read it. You can know that there's not one little thing you do for this church and for him that he doesn't see. And to your wife behind, I know you guys are both, you guys have been here so long, you guys are patriarchs of the church and you've been so loyal. God sees it all. And we see it, I see it. You know, sometimes we don't get recognized because you're in a quiet position and where you're at. But we love you. And I want to, and that goes not just for like for so many people that you don't think God sees. God sees every little thing we do. Every little thing we do, he sees it. And it pleases him. And there's a greater reward one day like for you Sue, for you. I believe Sue, right? <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, for, for you when you do your things in secret, when you're not recognized. So we love you, Ike. All right? God speaks to me through visions and dreams. And last night I had a dream that I was pulled over. I was on my way to fill a prescription and when I was pulled over the police officer was like what is this because I had the empty package and he said what is this and I told him what it was and that I was on my way to get a refill prescription he pretty much said well why do you have this and shoved me and I didn't fight back I just told him the truth and stood up and was honest and I believe that's what God's calling us to be even if we get shoved, we're not fighting. We're not fighting back, but we're being honest and we're, we're telling the truth. And I knew nothing about what you had been through this week, but I think that's why he shared that with me. Just to confirm to you, you did, you did exactly what we're supposed to do.
You hear it? All right. My name's Sloan, and um, I have a testimony to give. So it's actually a three in one. Um, in my family, there were three really incredible healings, back healings. Um, so it start, the story starts with um, when I was 12, I was diagnosed with scoliosis. And I've had decades of, well, I'm 50, so I've had almost 40 years of back pain, excruciating at sometimes. Sometimes I'll go a year with not much at all. It just comes and goes. My back is kind of vulnerable because of that. So um, I took my son to the chiropractor in the summer. He was um, hunched over. He kind of stood like this. And I said, stand up straight. And he said, okay. And then he said, ah. I said, what's going on? And he said, it, it's uncomfortable to stand up straight. So he just spent the whole summer like this. Um, and every, he wasn't, we weren't coming here because it was closed, I guess, in the summer. Um, but any, any of his friends or people in our neighborhood, the mothers, they all saw it. It was really obvious. And uh, I brought him to the chiropractor and he said, so he was around the same age I was when I was diagnosed. Um, with scoliosis and the chiropractor said yep he has scoliosis and I want you to get him um, x-rays and I was like oh I was so mad so disappointed so upset because I didn't I know what that means I mean my curve you can't you can't see it but it's you know it's there it's just you can't see it but I can see it if I'm in a mirror but um, his was very visible and I just knew it what it meant for him and I did not want this for him so I asked the chiropractor a bunch of questions. I was like, can you cure it? And he said, no. I said, is it hereditary? And he said, well, according to the textbooks, it's not hereditary, but I've seen enough of this in families that I question that. I was just asking him any questions that came to mind because I was like, this can't be happening. Um, and I said, can you make it not get worse by doing adjustments? And he said, no, it's going to get worse. And I was like, oh. So I just like cried out to God when I got home. And I'm like, Lord, please don't let him have this please heal him lord so we got the x-rays and brought him back and the chiropractor opened the x-rays and he said he's healed a hundred percent and i was like okay well is there any medical explanation and he said he's healed and i was like okay i was like i maybe didn't understand the question i'm like okay so i guess i've i've been going to this guy for a long time so he knows all my stuff about how i pray for miracles and people get healed and so i was like you know i pray for miracles and i'm like is there any medical explanation and he just looked at me and said he's healed <laughs> so i said all right and then i came back for my own back stuff a couple of weeks later and i said that was pretty cool and he goes yeah and i said you know i prayed to jesus for his healing and he said well I was really, really surprised. This time he was like willing to talk a little bit more. And um, he said, I was really surprised. And he, I said, I prayed to Jesus and he said, it worked. So he's giving God the glory. So anyway, that was really amazing and thank you, Jesus. Um, and these guys know, <laughs> they know my chiropractor. Um, so I had, my whole family got diagnosed with COVID-19 and we're all better now but I was laying in bed for basically a month and my back didn't like that because it's, you know, it's kind of vulnerable. So I was in excruciating back pain for a week. Like just, if I rolled over in bed, it was like, ow. If I stood up and walked, ow. Like it was excruciating and horrible. And um, I went to the chiropractor three, day, three days a week. It was just awful. And um, I, the third day I went to him, I said, Dr. O'Brien, I made an appointment with my friend who, has the gift of healing and she's I made a prayer appointment this afternoon at two o'clock and he said all right that's really good I'm glad you did that and because he's already he knows what's going on so um I was like okay I gotta get to two o'clock I don't know how I'm gonna because they gave me muscle relaxers just to survive so I was like I can't take the muscle relaxers because it puts you to sleep so I was like all right I'll just I'll lay down I'll put ice packs on my back I'll get on my side I'll take a couple aspirin so I can be awake for this prayer appointment and so I got on the phone with her and she said all right, the Lord told me he's going to put you to sleep. And I'm like, all right, good. And I don't. So then she prayed for me for an hour. I was asleep for half of that. And then, you know, she hung up. And then I woke up two, two hours and 45 minutes later and no pain. And then I got up and I'm like, I think I'm healed. And then I'm like, I'm just going to take it easy. Okay, I don't know what's going on. This is me. This is awesome. And then um, 
The next day I woke up and I went for a walk, which I hadn't done. I cleaned the whole house. I scrubbed the bathroom, scrubbed the, I scrubbed everything. So I was like, I haven't been able to do that for a month because I had COVID. Um, so I was like, ooh, I can clean, I can, you know. Um, anyway, I still had discomfort though, but I was pain free. So it was like a very clear miracle. I went from excruciating pain to just discomfort. Then, okay, then like a few days, so that's my second healing. So we have Matthias with his healing from scoliosis. Then I had a miraculous healing from excruciating pain, but I still had some discomfort. So then I fell down the stairs. Like I was still dealing with the discomfort. I fell down the stairs. Like I really fell down the stairs and hit everything. And I couldn't believe it. I'm like, you gotta be kidding me. Like, I can't believe this. No, it can't be happening. So then I was in pain again and um, black and blues and uh, I was like, this is not happening. So I came to church a couple weeks ago, I think, and I asked Ellen Cole to pray for me, and I was miraculously healed again. No pain at all. Like, right then and there, boom, I walked out of the church. I didn't have any more pain after that. So he, God apparently doesn't want my family to suffer in back pain. <laughs> uh. Your way. 
to share. I had to write it down because there were so many intricate pieces compact into one week for this one miracle that every little up, every little down that was happening all week, I didn't want to miss any of the, the glory for God in it. So I, I'll be reading it, which normally I wouldn't be. We have had emergency custody of two small boys since October 23rd. Both boys had rotted, broken teeth. Two-year-old Samson was supposed to have oral surgery on December 28th, but when we got COVID test results, mine was positive. So they automatically canceled his surgery because I'm the, I'm the caregiver and I was supposed to be with him. The following week, daycare was closed for the holidays, so between that and the quarantine, we had our two and four-year-old boys all day, every day, for 11 days straight, and we needed a break. I remembered our small group leader had mentioned a dear friend of hers that used to foster children, and when I told of our situation, had volunteered to give us a respite as needed. We had only met her once, but decided to reach out to her to take her up on her offer. And so we made plans to meet on Wednesday, January 6th, so the boys could get to know her before the planned overnight that Friday, January 8th. Samson's surgery was rescheduled for a month later, but I had asked them to let me know if something opened up sooner because his teeth were bothering him. They called me on Monday, January 4th, and said that they could get him in on Tuesday, January 12th. This, was also, this also meant that Samson, myself, and his mom would all have to be COVID tested again, knowing that it's possible to repeat a positive result even after you are no longer contagious, I did not want to risk having his surgery auto canceled. So I decided not to get tested, but rather find a replacement chaperone. When I called Samson's mom to let her know that she would need to be retested, she started crying because she said she wasn't feeling well and she too didn't want to risk another auto cancellation. So now I had a problem. I have authorization to bring him, or his mom can go with a chaperone, but now neither I nor she would be able to go. To complicate things further, the dentist's office called me on Tuesday to say that due to an uptick in COVID cases, all elective surgeries were being canceled starting the following Wednesday. Now the situation has become, it's next Tuesday or not at all. On Wednesday, I spoke with CPS to ask if they could possibly bring him, and the caseworker was willing, but said she had to speak with her supervisor and would let me know tomorrow. Thursday is the COVID testing day, so whoever was chaperoning had to be tested that very next day on Thursday. We went to dinner with our, at our new friend's house, and she happens to be a surgical nurse at the hospital in the county where the surgery was taking place. Thursday morning, the CPS worker got back to me to say her supervisor would not allow her to bring Samson. In desperation and in faith, I texted our new friend and asked if there was any way that she could bring him. She swiftly responded, wow, seems odd CPS would let us, but I can and am willing. 
I asked CPS to draft a letter giving a permission to chaperone him and they agreed and got it to me by noon. My friend who worked at the hospital where they do the testing swiftly got herself tested. It all seemed set. And then the dentist called and said the surgery place declared that CPS letter giving permission was insufficient. That it required word in giving my friend permission to sign all consents. CPS was not willing to do this. I cried out to God, Lord, you love this boy and you know he needs the surgery and you know it is next Tuesday or never. You have authority over CPS. You have authority over the surgery place. Lord, open the doors and make this surgery happen. I got a call a short while later saying, this is good news. The surgery center will accept the letter as long as mom answers the phone for consent the day of the surgery. I said to the lady, thank you, Jesus. I've been working and praying, working and praying all day. The only obstacles left were the COVID results for Samson and my friend and for mom to answer the phone the day of the surgery. Both tests were negative and mom answered the phone. God is so good. Thelma Kennedy. I've been a member of this church for over 50 years, and I, I just wanted to share something with everyone, whether you know it or not. Some people here may know, others may not. It depends on what news that you watch. Uh, if you watch the regular news, it's probably not going to be on there because they're not going to tell about the good things that happen within the Christian community. But California is having a great revival. Um, I've often thought that it was so bad, Lord, you know, if I weren't a Christian, I'd say, let it fall in the ocean, you know, it was that bad between Hollywood and all the other stuff that's going on. But Hollywood is have, or California is actually baptizing them in the ocean, okay, and they're having a great revival. And they're one of the prophets, and I don't know if you're following the prophets or not, but his name is Mario Murillo. But he's more an evangelist than he is a prophet, okay? And that's his field, evangelism. And he said, no, this, this COVID virus is not going to shut us down from reaching the people that need to be reached. And they did a revival, an old-fashioned revival, tent revival in Bakersfield, the worst place you could probably go, just about as bad as, as uh, <clears throat> Chicago and, and some of the other areas. And they're bringing drug addicts and people that are coming and being instantly healed. And now they're going in other areas. And that now California, that has been basically a blue state, may be turning red, meaning that these people are coming together as Christians. People are changing and saying enough is enough. And they're now recalling their governor. He's being going to be being recalled. They've got almost enough votes already, and they still have time yet to do it, to recall their government governor and put him out of office. Okay, that's one thing. The second thing that you may or may not have heard about, and I, I was just it just set my soul on fire, is Honduras. Honduras has come against abortion, even from any at the point of conception the whole country has come against it and any mother who goes ahead to abort her baby or any third party that wants to try will automatically be prosecuted so God is on the move now the other thing that has been on my heart and it has for a long time my, my son and I have prayed about it Albany has been known as one of the worst areas in the country spiritually Okay, for some reason. Um, there are a lot of beautiful churches here. Don't get me wrong. There are many beautiful Christians. But overall, it, 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 there's a lot of resistance. And I know where I'm living. I know there is. Um, but I'm saying New York is bad. New York is almost as bad as California in many ways. 
and yet we have some beautiful churches and beautiful pastors and beautiful Christians here and we've talked about unity and there are many churches that are falling by the wayside because of the COVID virus they just don't have enough people that are staying firm within the church to keep it one to keep it alive and we've been saying this for years we Christians have to come together we have to come together with unity with other Christians. I'm not talking about unity between Democrats and Republicans. You can't make, you can't have the devil and sit there and compromise with the devil. You can't. That's the way it is. But within the Christian church, yes, you can. And there's no reason why we shouldn't be able to go to these other Christian churches and find the ones that are falling by the wayside or even who are keeping a board base. There's enough around here. There's Sita Abraham, a Messianic Christian church. There's Grace Fellowship. There's several. I know there's another one over. In, uh, there's many, many, okay, that we should be able to get together. And why can't we have a tent revival in this country? What are we sitting and waiting for? Are we waiting to hear what the prophets or whether it's going to come through? Are we waiting because we're saying we're in the last days that, okay, yo, God's coming. We're going to be raptured soon. What does God tell us to do? He doesn't tell us to stop and wait. He tells us to occupy. There are souls out there, and I know where I am over in the Beltran. There are people that are terrified. They won't come out of their rooms because they're so afraid of the, this virus. And a lot of it, and I'm sorry, yes, it is true a virus, but I don't think it's any worse than, than a flu would be. But it, for some people, it's more deadly than others because of your system being compromised. So I think they've taken it and they've used it to go ahead and tie the church down in particular. And we need to just go ahead and what can we fight back? Revival. That's how we're going to fight back when we get a revival. And I think we need to unify with all the churches that are willing to come together and let's do something and get it started now. If the Lord comes and does a mighty miracle this way, which I think he can do and he is working, uh, we're going to have people that are going to need a churches and peace to, people to pastor them and to do these things. But we also need to go ahead and now, the, many people are hungry, they're afraid, they need the church now, and they don't know where to go. So I think it's just a thought, pray about it. I'm an idea person, I'm not necessarily a person who knows how to get it started, but I'm saying I'm being willing to help with it, and I would love to see our church because I've always felt that this church um, has been a lighthouse, and I said it's going to be a lighthouse again. And I'll just share one quick thing, and I don't mean to take up so much time, but when my son died in a construction ac accident over there in Heritage Park 35 years ago, and it was su very suddenly, and the, the whole area, people knew, knew my son and my family very well, and this church was on fire. And we had his funeral service here. And I had people in my community that came from other churches, and they came up to me and they said, there's something special about your church, something when I can come in, they could feel God's presence here. And I know what it did during the charismatic renewal, and God's not finished with this church yet. We have to come and unite, and we have to deal with whatever it is in our lives. If there's something there we need to deal with that we don't want to deal with, we have to be completely surrendered to God, not just 98%. If you've got something in your life that you know deeply that you need to take care of, you need to take care of it now, because when it happens, the Holy Spirit's going to fall mightily on this congregation and in this area, and Albany needs everybody. Amen. We have, uh, I, I want to be respectful of time. I love this. This is amazing. I just want to read. Has anyone seen um, the prophetic word by Russ Walden about Albany? I pulled it up. I want to read it for everyone. A Return of the Great Awakening. This was published uh, the, the 8th of January. Albany will be a wash in my glory. A Return of the Great Awakening is coming. It will wash ashore on the Upper East Coast of the United States. Albany, New York will be a wash of my glory. I will cleanse Albany, New York from its foulness, and those who hide in darkness and work their deceit and wickedness in the secret places will be abruptly exposed in a moment of time. Many who have worked deceit and oppression on the earth will come to total repentance in the outpouring of my spirit. 
I say to those of my people in Albany who have not soiled their purity and corruption of that city, I choose you this day to walk before me robed in white. Now comes the unleashing of the Holy Spirit of repentance, beginning in Albany and surging like an unstoppable wave throughout the United States and to the world's furthest corners. Get ready, says God. Gird up your legs like men for this, uh, for it is time to overtake the footmen and run with the horsemen of the earth who go to and fro, bringing about my will. Real quick remembrance from the deep past. Uh, just in context of what uh, Peter was saying. We are the state capital of New York. And many years ago, is back in the late 70s, believe it or not, we had a fairly famous politician get saved, and he was a member of this church for a while. Any of you remember David Enino? Enino? Okay, one or two. This man was the press secretary to the then lieutenant governor. Politicians, even as he referred to himself, political whores, they can and do get saved. And we are in the right place for it. I had a vision several years ago. I haven't shared it much. But now is the time. Now is the place. Because the Lord said, get up, share it. We were having a worship meeting down by the river in Riverfront Park in the amphitheater down there. Jim probably remembers because I think he was down there playing with Forever One. And the Lord kept telling me, look at the river. Look at the river. Look at the river. And then he was having me look around. And he said that Albany would be an epicenter. And that surrounding it from as far as the headwaters of the Hudson and the Mohawk, there would be, it would be an epicenter of revival. I told Bob this when we got in the car. We went home and looked at a map. The headwaters of the Hudson Lake Tear of the Clouds in the Adirondacks, and the headwaters of the Mohawk, whose name I can't remember, off in western New York someplace, are both almost exactly 100 miles equidistant from Albany. You don't think God didn't put them there? If you take a map and draw a 100-mile circle around Albany, with Albany as the center. You're talking about almost to Hartford, almost to New York City, almost to the Canadian border, almost to Syracuse, Binghamton, Rome, Utica, Worcester, all of Connecticut, or most of it, parts of Rhode Island, the Northeast Corridor. The Lord said, Albany will be my epicenter. Amen. Let's stand. Uh, we're going to sing two more songs. I'm, I'm going to do the benediction. Um, we'll sing a short song and then a long song. But the, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you. <laughs> How does it go again? The Lord... Uh, <laughs> Lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen. It's actually someone in this room's birthday.
And that person is Carol Rimke. So before we sing our last song, we're going to sing happy birthday to Carol. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Carol. Happy birthday to you. was just reminding me, uh, Sloan, about 28 years ago when we came in to have uh, Jevin's baptism, our oldest son, three months old or whatever he was, and Lori couldn't stand, and her back was like this, and Doug Donovan prayed on her, and she stood up. So, I've got a history of being healed several times, sometimes through uh, prayers at this church. I'm a firm believer in the miracles of God, so don't take this the wrong way. 
okay? Because I'm walking up here thinking I'm going to get booed off stage. But I woke up this morning and I told Lori, my, my spirit is troubled. I don't know what to do with it. I don't know why. But when scripture is on your uh, mind when you first wake up and it's the first thing that you hear the Lord telling you, I take that seriously. And what it was, was John chapter 20. Well, I'm not going to flip back to that. But in John chapter 20, when Thomas finally gets to put his fingers in the holes and feel the side and see him, and he says, my Lord and my God. And Jesus says to him, because you've seen, you believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and have yet believed. The next thing that, uh, that brought me to was Matthew chapter 16. And it's the demand for a sign. Now you guys know how the, the call is just like it's, it's an all-encompassing thing for us right now on the call committee. We're in prayer. We're, we're ruminating over what we've seen and, and what we've prayed about and what the Lord is telling us. And the demand for a sign of chapter 16, the Pharisees and Sadducees came to Jesus and tested him by asking him to show them a sign from heaven. We have to be careful that when we're asking God to tell us that we're not demanding a sign from God to let us know that we're hearing him right. So just bear with me on that. We want to be completely open to what the Holy Spirit is saying to us on the call committee, to, to the congregation as a whole, to what God is saying to us, but we're not demanding a sign from God that we, Lord, show us that this is from you, okay? Because that's sorcery. That's not what we're about, and that's not what this next you know, 48, 72 hours of prayer is about. This is serious stuff. But it's um, very, very humbling to try to get this right. And that's what we want. We want to get this right um, in humility. Uh, the elders, the church council leadership, we, we just want to do the right thing and hear God however he, however he wants to talk to us, be it through his word, pointing us just be through peace or if he chooses to speak to one of us, or all of us. What was in chapter 16 that I wanted to share with you also was that when Peter declared that Jesus was the Messiah, Jesus said to him, who do people say the Son of Man is? And he said, what do you, who do you say that I am? And Simon Peter answered, You are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by flesh and blood, but my Father in heaven. Then when Jesus predicted his death shortly after that, Never, Lord, this shall never happen to you. This was the same Peter right afterwards, his shining moment. And he came back and said to him, Never, Lord. And Jesus turned and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me. You do not have in mind the concerns of God, but merely human concerns. This is a struggle. That it's what we want, and it's not what we want. God, if he has a pastor for us, it's his pastor for us. It's not the pastor that we want. We may think it's the pastor that we need, but we need to have our will aligned with God, that we want the pastor that he wants for us, if he wants a pastor for us. He has no, made no promise to us that he's going to give us a pastor. If you're claiming a promise from God that we will get a pastor, you're wrong. I've seen no promise that we will have a pastor. God knows what we need, and he will provide what we need. And it may be that he will provide a pastor, and he may provide a pastor for us very soon, and he may not look anything like what you expect a pastor to look like or what you expect the right pastor for this church at this time will look like. Be prepared, be open, and listen to him. Thank you. Amen. I, um, 
as Mr. Dollard was sharing, that there was a scripture that was running through my heart almost the whole service. And it was when Israel was crying out for a king. And they were, they were begging and almost demanding, God, give us a king, give us a king, because we want to be like the other nations. Everybody else has a king. We want a king. And the scripture was just running through my heart and, and running through my head. Um, I was down in New York City this past weekend for, for a healing service for, for my back. And um, there was a gentleman who was there, and, and many people like, claim him as a prophet and many things. Um, and I went there, and, and I saw a lot of people get prayed for. But as I was in line to get prayed for, I just had a check in my spirit. It wasn't, it wasn't right, and I got out of line. And uh, the people that I was with, they were like, yo, you need to go up there, bro. You need to get healed. You need to get this man to lay hands on you. He's the one that's going to do it. If you're going to get healed, you need to go and see him. And I just didn't feel peace, and I got out of line. And the next morning, um, I got in a, a hotel room with a buddy down there. Um, my buddy woke up, and he just prayed for me, and he laid hands on me. And, and the whole day, I didn't have pain. I walked around New York City. Um, I was in Brooklyn, I had taken a subway, and this is the first time I've been able to actually come and play here with, you know, and, and worship. And I just want to encourage you guys that we don't look to man, exactly as Mr. Dollar said, this is not up to us. We don't get to choose the man. God is not a God that does what we say. We do what he says. And so I just want to offer up a prayer if that's okay. Father, I just thank you, Lord God. I thank you that you know the times, the seasons, the dates. You know the person, be it one, God, if there is one to be here. Father, I thank you that there are so many here that love you, that desire to see you move. And God, most of all, we know that you want to move more than we want you to move here. You desire to pour out your spirit to save, to deliver, to set free. So, Father, this morning, God, we lift up our hands and we just say, have your way, God. Your kingdom come and your will be done. Whether you raise up somebody or whether you don't, whether it's somebody from without or somebody from within, Lord God, you know. And we just say, have your way, Lord, have your way. Because, God, we do not look to man, but we look to you. And we thank you, God, in Jesus' name. God has a, God has a sense of humor. I used to... He's so scared to speak in front of people publicly. But, but I, everything he just said, what a beautiful man of God back there. Um, God's, God's using his church. And last week we had four new members. What's grown isn't dying. And, you know, revival, it's funny because I would have never thought about revival in my life. You know, some years back I was so caught up in my business and, and just my pursuit of happiness. And God train wrecked me. And then revival has been on my heart and, and for this church. And uh, when I was on the, one time I went to, to, to Billy Graham to the Cove as I felt God called me to spend time with me. He kept on telling me that he wanted me to go up to the top of the mountain. And um, it's four miles up into the woods. And you ever be deep in the woods and you don't know where you are? It kind of gets a little eerie, you know, when you know when they got bear signs and everything. And, but I finally got up there. The spirit of fear, God hasn't given us a spirit of fear, but a power and a love and a sound mind got me to the top of the mountain because I almost came down twice. And I remember when I was up there, it was just me and God. It was just an awesome, awesome experience. And so if God ever prompts you to do something, just obey it. Even if it doesn't make sense to you, just do it. Because it was that, there was many things I got out of that. But I remember praying for the coming revival. And my words were, were, weren't, asking. I was praying for the coming revival, and I was praying that Grace Fellowship and Our Savior's Lutheran Church would lead the cause of what's about to come in. And it's funny because I always loved this church, and I wasn't, you know, even though I wasn't here, I still was a part of it. And it's funny how God's brought me back. And as you still don't see my wife and my children here, I believe possibly they will be eventually someday. It's not that they're, they're um, against it. They just don't feel the calling to come back here. But I believe one day they'll be sitting with me here. And, and, and if not, it's okay. But, but God is going to use this church. And like I said, the pressure that's on you, don't take the pressure off because it's all God. And I agree with what you're saying. And you know what? It might not be a dramatic, just we don't rush it. Revival starts with the individual, each one of us, and then it spreads out. And last week, God granted four new members. It could be the hand, it could be a foot, it could be an elbow, but we now have more part of a body, and he's going to just bring them in, 
and and it's just it's going to grow and just just out of love and humility and unity it will grow and when he wants to grant us a pastor if he wants to grant us a pastor and like you said it might come from within <laughs> maybe even back there <laughs> he's got a beautiful heart uh you don't know just just be patient don't rush god and you'll if you don't get an answer you'll at least have a peace so god's going to use this church